Hello and welcome to News Click and this is a series of interviews analyzing three years of the Modi government. Today we are in conversation with John Cherian, senior journalist and associate editor at the Frontline magazine, where we will speak with him about uh, foreign policy. Uh, John, welcome to News Click. Thank you. Uh, in, um, in the arena of foreign policy, it's said that shifts take place incrementally, often um, you know, over decades because of a big sort of country that India is. If you look at three years of the Modi government, do you see a certain level of continuity with the previous UPA regime or is there some shift that we can glean? Foreign policy under Modi, I think, is a bigger disaster than it was under Manmohan Singh. Under UPA, there was a certain degree of finesse which is lacking uh, uh, under NDA too. When Modi started, you remember he called all the uh, leaders of the South Asian region, including Nawaz Sharif, uh, for his inauguration. For it. Uh, the idea he tried to project was that yeah, under him, India would have zero problems with uh, its neighbors. But that's not the case today. After three years, you find that India is having problems with virtually all its South Asian neighbors. Mm -hmm. Especially, uh, you know, uh, the NDA's uh, policy towards Pakistan, I think, is a total disaster. Kashmir today is in flames. I mean, there have been no talks for the last three years with uh, Pakistan. Can you imagine three years without any uh, high-level talks? Except, you know, some photo ops. Under NDA, Kashmir is back into uh, international focus. I mean, staying on the point of South Asia, India sort of um, ensured that the 19th SARC summit in Pakistan collapsed. So SARC seems like it's dead in the water. What is your assessment of, you know, the SARC forum itself? I th this government has indicated that it doesn't give too much importance to SARC. It's giving, uh, it's, it wants to build up an alternate grouping of countries uh, towards the east of India, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, uh, Thailand. But uh, SARC uh, as, as an institution, I think, will continue. It has to continue. And this is not the first time that the SARC summit has been postponed. It has been happening even during the UPA time and before. Uh, you know, I think on an average, the SARC summit now uh, take place once in two years. Mm -hmm. So, but the uh, SARC summit has to be held in uh, Islamabad. So maybe that will uh, could provide a breakthrough in, uh, in you know, for talks, hopefully. But uh, uh, not many are uh, hopeful about uh, you know talks taking place during uh, uh, the tenure of Mr. Modi. Talks with Pakistan. What are the sort of more strategic shifts that you see under Modi in terms of India-U.S. relations? You have. Now, apparently, India being a major defense partner, you have a logistics agreement. What is all I of think, this? I think, yeah, yeah, signing of the logistics agreement and uh, and virtual uh, granting of uh, basing, fa basing uh, military basing facilities. That I think is a dangerous step this uh, government has taken. Uh, I don't know if it is true, but there are reports that uh, American naval ships can uh, now dock on the Gujarat coast and they can be serviced. And, uh, you know, there are there's also talk about uh, Americans being offered lily pad uh, bases in the, in the country. So, uh, I think this uh, India government has bent over backwards to be on the right side of Washington. Mm -hmm. But I think they are again miscalculated because uh, the Trump administration has different uh, priorities, as has been obvious. Ever since he has come to power, he has not even uh, bothered to give an official invitation to uh, uh, Mr. Modi for a visit to Washington. President Xi had a highly publicized summit with him. And uh, the focus of the Trump administration, at least now, is not on uh, the pivot, the military pivot to the east which Obama was focusing on, and the Americans needed allies against uh, China. Just to get some more detail on the China point, so for China, clearly India seems to be in the U.S. camp in terms of Asia. And for instance, you have the Belt Road Initiative conclave happening in Beijing. It's going to conclude today. In spite of getting invitations, India has refused to go, citing 
the China-Pakistan economic corridor and the sort of sovereignty concerns around that. As you remember, the Chinese President, President Xi was the first, uh, one of the first world leaders to visit uh, India after Modi came over. Yeah, they, they had the highly publicized meeting. They only recently they may, again made a statement on Kashmir saying that you know, they are neutral on the issue. The Chinese ambassador here made a speech uh, saying that uh, they are willing to accommodate uh, India's concern on the Belt Road Initiative. So India suddenly, uh, they put up this objection about the Belt Road uh, passing through uh, the disputed uh, territory of Gilgit Baltistan. Now, as the Chinese have been pointing out, I mean, that's the only way for the road to pass because there's no other way. And they, and they are not uh, in any way saying that this that area belongs to Pakistan. And they even were willing to uh, change the name of the... Uh, all the countries, major countries in the world uh, were present at the Belt Road Summit in Beijing. India was the sole absent here. Uh, even Americans, uh, even the Americans uh, sent a delegation. John, on the issue of West Asia, which you've written much about, uh, the question of Palestine, the ongoing conflict in Syria. Do you see any sort of shifts? Has there been any contribution from this government in terms of addressing some of the concerns? Oh, well, the only good thing I can say about this government is that they have not uh, openly taken a stand against uh, the government of Syria. But in practice, um, uh, they have strengthened relations with uh, countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Qatar, and of course, Israel. I mean, these are all uh, sworn enemies of, uh, um, of uh, Syria. It has not uh, made any statements, where, for instance, when uh, the America sent its uh, Tomahawk uh, cruise missiles to, uh, against uh, attacking Syria. There was no statements uh, condemning the attack. As such, so India is sitting on the fence as far as Syria is concerned, but uh, relations with Israel have been uh, further strengthened uh, to such an extent that for the first time the Indian Prime Minister will be visiting Israel. Israel today is, uh, has now become the number two arms uh, supplier to India. And India is going to, uh, probably it can even uh, become number one. America, as you know, is now the number one supplier and Russia is uh, number three. And it has, uh, and for the first time under the NDA, under this government, India abstained on an issue, uh, on, a, on a resolution on Palestine, on human rights issues. Palestinian people and the Arab street knows that India now is a virtual ally of the Israel. John, my last question is about the opportunities that uh, the sort of multipolar world that's evolving, uh, you know, offers to India, which is to reinvigorate forums like the Non-Aligned Movement, the G77. You have BRICS, which is a new constellation of rising powers. Um, the Prime Minister didn't go to the last NAM summit in Venezuela. Uh, there was a 60 years of Bandung summit as well in 2015. India sent um, a junior delegation. So clearly, uh, you know, you're not sort of putting any efforts into reinvigorating these platforms. I don't think India is serious uh, anymore about the multipolar world. It wants, it, uh, it's, it has somehow uh, come to the conclusion that uh, there's only one superpower, the United States, and it's good to be an ally of the United States. Well, they try to explain it uh, by saying that this is what uh, China did in the um, late 70s, up, you know, after Deng Xiaoping opened up. And that's one reason why China could, you know, f focus on uh, development and, uh, and then it, its economy started booming. So they are trying to replicate the Chinese model here, but I don't think uh, that's really uh, possible here in India. I mean, the Chinese case was totally different. And, the Chi and China never openly uh, sided with uh, the United States on foreign policy issues. Of course, it did uh, here and there, like they supported the Americans in Afghanistan and in Cambodia against, uh, against the government there at that time. But uh, they never allowed, uh, ba gave the Americans basing facilities or, uh, or joined, uh, or allowed their troops to uh, use Chinese territory. 
So, um, and on BRICS also, I mean, in the last BRICS summit here in Goa, India tried to use that as a platform to attack uh, Pakistan. I mean, uh, and uh, of course, uh, they, because of uh, the dominant role played by China and Russia in the BRICS grouping, uh, they, try, they issue statements which are, uh, call for multipolarity. But the fact of the matter is that in BRICS, is India is uh, tilting towards Washington, so is uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. With the new, uh, with yeah. the, uh, so BRICS, you know, I don't know what what the future is there for BRICS. Yes, the very fact that uh, Modi didn't bother to attend uh, the, the NAM summit, India being one of the founder members of uh, NAM, I mean that speaks volumes. Anyway, this had already started during the uh, Congress-led regime too. I mean they were also downplaying uh, the NAM movement. But at least they bothered to keep up appearances by sending the Prime Minister to all the uh, NAM summits. So that's all the time we have, John. Thank you very Thank much you. for your assessment of uh, the foreign policy record of the Modi government.